Now, people are talking about sequestering carbon by pumping it into the earth. Um, frankly, I think the public is confused what carbon sequestration really is. I just saw a popular video that showed CO2 streaming down through the plants like this and out into the soil. And this is what people are being told is happening. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as CO2 coming down through the plants and being captured by the soil. I don't know who are the people coming up with this stuff. They're, they're great infographic artists making animated films of carbon bubbling down into the soil. It's, it's a fabrication of science. And why aren't the scientists standing up and saying, hey guys, that's not accurate? You know, the amount of exudates that plants put in the soil is tiny compared to their biomass development. And they're making it look like that's the mechanism right there. Welcome to episode 106 of The Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of The Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label distinguishing organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on well-managed pasture. You just heard from Will Brinton, a PhD soil scientist and founder of Woods End Laboratories. Will's point of view is informed by his many years of studying soil He's familiar with how difficult it is to gain an accurate, constant, and meaningful measurement of soil carbon from a farm or even just one field. And it's led to his suspicions of the current push to provide funding for what's known as climate smart agriculture. Climate smart has become a buzzword, especially for chemical agriculture. And we all need to become familiar with what it means as we start to see the label in the marketplace. This episode is timely. I'm here in Washington, D.C. today, taking part in the Climate Rally for Resilience put on by NSAC, as well as speaking with representatives about the upcoming Farm Bill with the Organic Farmers Association. Today's guest is a strong scientific voice for the climate benefits of organic farming. You heard from him in our 2023 virtual symposium, which just wrapped up this weekend. Tickets are still available to watch the recordings of both sessions which discuss the rise of regenerative no-till farming and the current criticism of all tillage practices. You can find tickets to the recordings at realorganicsymposium.org. I'm very pleased today and, and, and honored to be talking to an old friend, Will Brinton. Um, and uh, Dr. Will Brinton, who has been a, a researcher in, in soil health, soil science, and organic agriculture for, for uh, as long as I've been an organic farmer. And exactly. I started talking to you, Will, way back when, in the 1980s, and the conversation has been ongoing. And uh, we've been honored and privileged to have you be part of our standards board as we, for Real Organic, as we try and figure out what are the standards that we should be holding organic to because they've wandered so far. And, um, and we've, we've just been diving in. You've been showing me around. I've been recording it. And you have an article here that you're working on called Regenerative. Is it a useful new label in farming? So let's talk about that because that is one of the big, big themes for our, our winter conference this year. Is it? Is Regenerative a useful label? Well, as I tried to show in this article I'm working on is this discussion has actually been going on for over 40 years. We just didn't know it. And what's so interesting to me, and this is what makes it so amazing to me, I was at the meeting in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, when Bob Rodale announced the regenerative label. I just happened, I mean, I grew up in Pennsylvania and I happened to be visiting my parents and I saw this little press event was announced and it's an hour north of, of where I lived formerly in Chester County. So I said, I'll go to that. And the thing that struck me about the meeting, it was crowded with government people and USDA people. The room was so packed, they pushed, I remember being pushed to the back of the room and all these guys in coats and ties were there and I thought, what is going on? 
and then he announces regenerative. So in this paper, I go back and look at what was happening that year that that was so important. And so I discovered a couple of things that I should have known and I didn't know. The first organic production act was proposed and, not, and submitted to the House in 1982. Submitted to the Senate was the Innovative Farming Act. And then uh, both were submitted. The, because the House package failed, it was like a, almost a tie vote, but um, it never went further. Somebody started a third one called the Regenerative Farming Act. And Senator Leahy was involved in all this. It's really how interesting is how long this is stretched out. And that same year, Rodale announces the magazine has a new subtitle, The Magazine of Regenerative Agriculture. So I brought a copy this here. Was new Farm was the magazine? Yeah, look at this. <laughs> Yes. Now, I just, this is my own copy mailed to me in <laughs> 1983. So I just, um, uh, I just contacted Jeff Moyer at Rodale and said, was this the first? And he said, no, the first was December 82. So <clears throat> that, that was when, that was when, when they switched the name, when they changed the name on that magazine. Yes. So listen to this. They changed the name at a point that Congress was about to vote in legislation that would have immortalized regenerative. I mean, talk about being savvy in business and having your pulse, hand on the pulse of the times. What would that have meant for them had that bill passed and they had this magazine waiting in the wings? I'm just saying that so much of this comes back to a personal story or a story of a company. This was a company and a corporation with some inspired individuals, first J.I. Rodale and then Robert Rodale. But it's just a handful of people that set this whole thing in motion. Do you believe that the, that the regenerative um, law that was being proposed, that that name originated from Rodale? I believe it did. Yeah. Because he had the meeting and he stood up there and he said, we need a word to accentuate, change, modify organic. Now, um, Kitty Liebhardt just wrote me, her husband, Bill Liebhardt, worked at Rodale in the early years and she said her understanding then was they meant it to replace the word sustainable. But so, I mean, we could work on this a little bit, and I bet there's letters and documents that could show the thinking. But I think it was original thinking on their part, um, just where they came up with regenerative. I remember being sort of stunned by it, and my organic friends did not like it. Um, you might have been one of them, but I know others around that time said, why are we, change why are we talking of name changes right now? So, um, you know, there's a theory of history that says when you leave something off like that, it's going to come back later, but in a different form. And so here it is today. The regenerative has just emerged again. It's, I mean, would you agree it's almost wildly popular? It, it's, we're seeing it everywhere. Yes. Yes, it's exploding and it's fascinating to me why it's exploding. And I have my theories, but I'd love to hear yours. I mean, I, I, I don't believe this is just a spontaneous eruption. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, a carefully crafted marketing campaign. I, I think it comes from the major big ag food corporations. The only thing that makes me wonder about that is I heard people like Gabe Brown using the word before the corporations. Absolutely. Did. Okay. Absolutely. There was, yeah. a, there was a movement of Midwestern farmers. Yes. Yeah. And, and um, the, one of the interesting questions I keep asking myself, and we can make all kinds of assertions here, did they start that because they were fed up with the bureaucracy of organic and organic certification? I have talked to growers who refuse to be certified. They just think, what's the government doing monitoring me? So that's one thing. And the other group of people feel 
organic is restrictive, you know, tells you what you can do, tells you what you can't do. I mean, that's the perception of some people and regenerative is pulled all the plugs out, you see. Regenerative frees you. You can now do anything. I just heard regenerative called the three C's. You know what that stands for? Chemicals and cover crops. <laughs> What's the third C? Oh, oh cover, cover crop. crop. Okay. So, yeah. in other words, your chemical farmer <laughs> throws some cover crop seeds in, you're regenerative. How simple and pathetic is that? So, all of a sudden, it's like giving people license to become regenerative by changing and modify only a few factors. Now, a big critique has um, emerged two years ago or three years ago from Washington State University, a guy named McGuire put up a website saying what's in the name Regenerative. And his group went after Gabe Brown's claims for rapid increases. He shows charts of organic matter just growing like this in the soil. Yes. And they reduce it to numbers. As you and I talked earlier about if you put so many tons of compost on the ground, how much is that? Is it an inch? Is it two inches? Could you sustain it? How fast, in other words, the question is, how fast could you raise the organic matter? If you did a one-to-one -one replacement of soil with compost right now, and that is adding another foot of compost and then mixing it to make a foot and a half of soil and compost, you could go from 2% organic matter to about 20, just like that, in one bump. But that's not sustainable, okay? So Washington State University said, Let's see if this is possible. And then they got distracted by the name regenerative and said, so what's regenerative? So there's a table, and I reference it in my new paper here. They have a table of five different models of regenerative farming. You, I think, I think no, Rodale is in there as regenerative organic. That's one of them. And that has the most standards or most restrictions in it. And then there's a, a form of regenerative that has all the chemicals plus the cover crops. And we just saw uh, Kiss the Ground film. It's chemicals, cover crops, and by the way, add a little compost. That could be another three C's. So all of a sudden, they say it has no definition. It has no standard. And meanwhile, organic is a monitored and, and regulated method. And if you leave America and go to Europe, it's the same thing again. It's closely watched. There's, there's more diversity and plurality in Europe in the certification seals. But Brussels, the, the Eurozone is still regular, has a central regulation to maintain the equivalency of all these labels. Right. The, the point being, the farmers are being measured and monitored. Now, you and I can have a little debate here about, is it accurate? Uh, how good is the monitoring? Um, there's been an issue in Germany now, how many chickens constitute free range. And one of the big certifiers, I think it's Naturland, has expanded it to like 3,000 birds. And that's too many. That's too many in one unit. And so people are saying that the label is being violated. But we'll put aside those questions. Regenerative has no monitoring. It has no restrictions. It has no similar guidelines. There's at least five. Actually, I saw that table by WSO and said, oh, I can now add two more to it that I just read about. And we just saw a study done by the German Ministry of Agriculture that's noticed the word regenerative. They do it in German now, regenerative, you know. And they said, what is this? Is it really meeting the claims? And they did a seven-year study that they just published and I read it and they said, it's not changing conventional at all. So this is going to send out a warning call in Germany. You can't just start saying things are regenerative um, without backing it up better. And this was true eclectic regenerativeness. They had everything in the mix. No-till, cation balancing a la Albrecht from America, a little bit of compost, um, a little bit of herbicides only when you need it. It was just the big mix. And so what 
I'm saying has already happened is a critique is growing of regenerative, just like it has always been there for organic. Mm. So the road now gets more difficult for the regenerative community. If they don't face that they need some monitoring, some standards, this thing will just, it just turns into a mess. I mean, the word sustainable right now, does it mean anything to you anymore? Does it mean anything to anybody anymore? I see it everywhere. Nobody really takes it serious anymore. It's not on labels, but it could be. It's just an adjective, right? What if that's where this is all going to go? And I think I would end, you know, if we're at the end of this whole discussion today, unless regenerative bends the knee to organic-like standards, it's not going to survive or shouldn't, because it, it, it becomes just a populist movement without any guidelines or any quality. You could say there's no quality to it, there's only quantity. The quantity is the loudness of the discussion. It's really developing its own problems. And meanwhile, we've got our own set of problems anyway <laughs> to maintain our movement, the organic movement. Yes, well, it, it might not mean anything, but I think it's, it's still going to have a huge impact, and, and a lot of it will be negative, unfortunately. When you say negative, how, in what ways are you qualifying that? I have heard a few serious champions of organic agriculture say, organic is wonderful, it got everything right except the climate. It missed that, but regenerative has that. And, and I've heard other regenerative champions attack organic as being destructive to the soil, as uh, leading to all kinds of terrible things, erosion and burning out the soil, but regenerative has it right. And those, those people are being listened to. And of course, they're being supported by massive industrial forces because every single major corporation in big ag and big food is now embraced regenerative. From Bear Monsanto to Syngenta to Cargill to Bungie to ADM to Pepsi to McDonald's. They, they came in later though. Yes, that's right. So okay. it started as a movement. It started as a populist movement. It's kind of anti-government. It's got a lot of the qualities of some of the politics we've seen in the last many years. And um, I'm not prepared to, I think, yes, there's now new impetus coming from the big agrochemicals, but they didn't cook this up. I think we did it to ourselves and there's a number of problems with that. They saw it happening and said, aha, you know, look what we can do with this. So, um, and, and that really concerns me. Um, and yes, that's a separate topic. I'm more interested in the people that I think should be more on our side who are saying they're now regenerative or being anti-organic. You know, the Ray Archuletas of the world uh, can give a speech that makes you want to burn in hell to use the word organic, right? Mm -hmm. So, those are the people that I'm interested in. First of all, I count many of them as friends, and then they say things like that, and you say, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second. Where, where is this coming from? I just read Tim LaSalle saying tilling soil oxidizes the carbon. Well, we just had that discussion out there looking at my carbon analyzer. To do that kind of oxidation, you have to push the temperature up to these ungodly levels to get the carbon to auto-oxidize. It is not a natural process. There's no auto-oxidation carbon taking place when you stir the soil. It's so resilient, the extra oxygen is just like, well, okay, there's some oxygen here. So the fact that scientists are misstating the facts really bothers me, you know, and, and I'm committed to this field of trying to make truthful and accurate statements of things. So. The auto-oxidation of carbon by tillage is a falsity and a false claim and does not happen. But you have to ask yourself, why is there an association of tillage with loss of soil organic matter? And to answer that question, just go back to the Dust Bowl. You know, what they were doing is plowing from row crop, from, from hedgerow to hedgerow, no intercropping, no winter cover, nothing but cropping and cropping. 
it was the absence of any green growth protecting the soil in the off times of the year that created the Dust Bowl. And it wasn't the tillage per se, although that exacerbated it, obviously. It was the absence of plant matter on the soil or soil cover that created this problem in the first place. And now everybody's glummed on to blaming it on tillage. So I've been following all the literature on soil tillage studies. And I just read a report, 1,100 paired studies of no-till conventional tillage, no differences in carbon in 10 years. So if what these people are saying is true, that tilling the soil just suddenly magically burns the carbon, why are we not seeing it in the science? So this is something that's now causing a deeper level of concern that regenerative and even no-till behind it is not on solid ground. And I think as we see these kinds of cracks in the wall appear, it's important to start following them and seeing what that can do for us. So if, if I understood you, you're saying that just the act of tilling the soil is not destructive to organic matter in the soil. What is destructive is not doing cover cropping, green manuring, intercropping, uh, crop rotation, the, these standard um, hallmarks of good agriculture and certainly of organic agriculture. Absolutely. I mean, in, in, in this paper I'm writing, I emphasize one thing and that people overlook. Organic has already always included no-till and people say, well, how can that be? Well, we always had long rotations with lay pasturing, which is essentially a grass-based no-till system for three to four years in a seven-year rotation, for example. Why did we do that? That's your soil restoration phase. It also interacts with animals in, that are integrated into the operation. And everybody knew that these crop rotations had to be expertly designed to be restorative and not degradative of the soil system. So we were able to balance tillage with no-till in the system, and it worked. I've done reviewed studies of 40 years of conventional organic farming that included tillage steady increase of carbon over the whole period of time. I just read a Swedish paper from Sweden. They said, okay, so what are the factors there? And they found the percentage lay, L-E-Y that is, in a rotation is the controlling factor of carbon increase, regardless of tillage, by the way. So th there's the answer right there. It's beautiful. Could you explain for people, Will, lay farming a little bit, you know, just a little more detail. You know, you want to ask Elliot Coleman that question. I did just ask him that question. <laughs> he answered it. But I'd just love to hear when you say that the deciding factor in that constant uh, increase of organic matter for these for these organic farms is the percentage of lay. What does that mean? Well, it's really the amount of land that you put into a per I'm calling it permanent cover. It's not permanent, but you put a, a percentage of the land every year into a cover that's for another purpose. And on, in the farming system that I studied growing up in Pennsylvania, where that had some of the country's oldest organic and biodynamic farms, they had six and seven year rotations, four years of which was either hay, hay is permanent no-till for that period of time, or pasture for the animals, or a mix of, of the two. So, and we learned that the better the quality of the hay, when we broke the ground after that time and went into one year of corn, for example, we needed no fertilizer. There was no nitrogen requirement for that one year of high yielding corn. And there was enough leftover energy from that lay part of the rotation to carry a small grain in the second year. And then you had to start rebuilding the soil. So. But it depended on the soil type that you were on too. It depended what, you know, are, are, are you the soil order of alpha sols, which most of Pennsylvania is, but suddenly you get into these Yulta sols, these southern red soils, that they can't even sustain that. They're, the rotations have to have more lay and more permanent cover than tilled to, to have the same net effect. 
And so it's, it's, it's as much art as science balancing these forces and factors. So when you're talking about lay farming, that is a little bit different from a cover crop or a green manure, because typically those would be at most one year. But not even one year anymore. Yeah. I mean, I'm seeing cover crop systems where you just throw the seed on the ground. It comes up after your small grain in the fall. It winter kills. It's, it's in the ground for what, 60 days? Yeah. There's no carbon benefit from that, I can tell you. But it does protect the surface of the soil. And it does take up nitrate and sequester nitrate in the tissue, particularly. Actually, cover crops are great in chemical farming because they're saving a lot of the wasted nitrogen that you put down, taking it up in the tissue, and it's like slow release fertilizer. It, it winter kills and it starts releasing that nitrate through mineralization the next spring. So it's it's really a clever, it's like putting a band-aid on to protect your little cut for a period of time. Yeah. So it, it has an important effect, but that is not gonna raise your carbon in your soil, particularly as they're 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 doing some kind of soil working at the same time to get the cover crop in there. Yeah. So when I studied farming in Europe, they, they had another name for, for cover crops. Cover crop is a relatively recent um, word usage. When I was growing up here, it was green manuring. That's know. what I call it. Too. Right. And, and um, in the Europeans in Germany, they called it Zwischenfrüchte, which means between crop. You, you stick it between things, which could be right between the rows of corn. So you'd under underseed. I remember a big debate at Rotel: was it underseeding or overseeding? You know, it was this huge interest in the '80s in underseeding everything, and we were growing legumes under corn until it got out of control, and the legumes were taking up more of the potassium that the corn needed. You know, while fixing nitrogen, the nitrogen fixation was so delayed. The corn didn't benefit necessarily that year. The next crop benefited from the legume that was the zwischen fruit in, in the corn. So all this stuff is in flux right now, but it's this balance of the amount of biomass to surface area that's controlling carbon. It's not just the soil management and soil preparation. And we haven't even explored that yet. I'm working on a paper with two other scientists that we need to do better canopy design. And canopy design means you shouldn't just be thinking of one crop that you're growing. You should have multiple layers of crops. Because studies of the carbon cycle in tropical rainforests is showing they have a multi-canopy system with at least three tiers from the lower story to the mid story, then to the upper story as the trees and branches overhead. They have all that capturing the CO2 coming out of the soil. And the amazing thing of these studies is that none of the CO2 is getting out of the system with a deep canopy system. So think of what it could mean for carbon sequestration. If we have canopy systems so that it's not just corn, but it's corn and something growing under it and something very close to the surface of the soil, they're all capturing carbon coming out of the soil. So that at the end of the day, there is no net release of CO2 into the atmosphere. Yes. So you see what I'm saying? We're, for, we're leaving out the biomass. We're leaving out the green photosynthetic engine of carbon capture, which is, which is what se sequestration means. I think it's really a misnomer to call it soil carbon sequestration. It's the plants that are fixing it. The soil is just temporary storage. Yes. That's all. And don't invent mechanisms of storage like that um, tillage destroys it because it's oxidized. Don't invent that stuff. It, it, think more about the plants, the photosynthetic plants that are capturing the carbon that's leaving the soil every minute of the day. The more the better for mineralization and feeding plants. Get a plant canopy there that's capturing that. And that's why these permaculture and multi-layer systems, you know, and agroforestry where you have the trees, and that's the future of a stable, sustainable food production system that's also climate friendly. 
Do you, could you tell me what you think about, you've seen very sophisticated organic farming. Is that climate friendly? I think the only reason we think organic is not climate friendly is it's a new word, climate friendly. <laughs> Come on now. I mean, when did this talk start? It's almost a fad, climate friendly. I mean, I know there's a lot of money on the table now from our government for, for climate smart farming. And you're going to see a huge amount of work in the next three to five years with people taking that money and, and coming up with interesting schemes and cooking up schemes and so on. And so we're going to see even more of this discussion in all directions. And I hope it will focus on plants as photosynthetic engines of carbon capture, but it could, it could be all kinds of strange things. Now, people are talking about sequestering carbon by pumping it into the earth. Um, Frankly, I think the public is confused what carbon sequestration really is. I just saw a popular video that showed CO2 streaming down through the plants, like this, and out into the soil. And this is what people are being told is happening. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as CO2 coming down through the plants and being captured by the soil. I don't know, who are the people coming up with this stuff? They're, they're great infographic artists making animated films of carbon bubbling down into the soil. It's, it's a fabrication of science. And why aren't the scientists standing up and saying, hey guys, that's not accurate. You know, the amount of exudates that plants put in the soil is tiny compared to their biomass development. And they're making it look like that's the mechanism right there. Mm. And, and so, we're seeing so much distortion right now. i am constantly heard that, that a plant will exude up to 30%, even up to 50% of, of its photosynthates in order to exchange with microbes and, and get the minerals it needs. Do you think that's an exaggerated I, I think those are grossly exaggerated. I've seen papers where they measure 1, 2, and 3%. And, and you have to think, what are you talking about when you exude that much organic matter in the soil? That would drive respiration of the soil system just beyond any... It, it would, what, what that would create is an anoxic zone around the plant root because it's going to need the oxygen to, to deal with that respiratory um, changeover there. The plant is not going to do that. It's not going to put more carbon into the system that is needed by just a micro thin layer of mycorrhizal type um, organisms or rhizosphere bacteria growing along the plant root that is less than a millimeter out into the soil around the roots. Like you pull a plant out of the soil and you look at the rootlets in the soil attached to it. Well, that's this rhizosphere. It's, it's not extending very far out into the soil. So what they're doing is they're exaggerating that to try to make convince us that this is the mechanism of carbon capture. It is not. It, it's a factor. But if the plants were dumping that much of their energy into the soil, driving respiration up like crazy, requiring more oxygen in the soil, the whole system would just come apart. And, and so I think we have to be really careful with those numbers and um, look at the kind of situations we would have. And, uh, you know, I'm always one for quantitation. How would you quantify that? You know, how do you quantify exudates going into the soil? You know, I'm beginning, I've talked to scientists about that, and they said, this is a really difficult field. How do you measure that? And, and so I think we have a quantitation problem there, and it's led to exaggerations. And um, let's face it, people keep talking about there's more microorganisms in a hand, in a thumb full of soil than all the humans on the face of the earth. Well, guess what? It's, it's, it's a fraction of 1% of the weight of the soil, guys. And if it were anything more, if it were more than that, Dave, the soil couldn't handle it. it. You would have these huge anoxic zones of no oxygen because the microbes are all clamoring for air to respire carbon. The reason there's so little carbon down deep is there's not enough oxygen to support any turnover. Yeah. And if you had that happen, you'd have a bog forming, you'd have a swamp, 
and you'd have methane gas bubbling up out of the soils. That's not what we're talking about. You know, these the carbon sequestration is getting so exaggerated, like we're going to make swamps around the world with high organic matter and then deal with the respiratory burden of the system to handle all that. So it's, 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 it's a difficult discussion. Yeah. Yeah, well, I have gotten false information about that. So, and I am relatively for a civilian. I'm not a civilian, I'm a farmer, but I'm not a scientist. I'm relatively well informed. So this is, of course, the challenge is there is so much misinformation. This probably is innocent. I think some of it isn't so innocent. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's hard to distinguish. There's a lot of innocent ignorance out there these days. And it's, you know, thanks to this whole media thing yeah. is you just look it up here and there it is. Yeah. Um, I have Google alerts that I use to bring myself up to speed on what's going on. And it's just carbon sequestration is just like this right now. And most of the stuff I read is highly inaccurate. And it really bothers me. Um, just some of it is plain not true. And and they're 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 all pretending to be scientists, and as though I'm crediting all the truthfulness to scientists, the scientists are just standing silently watching this go on. And one reason is they're all pulling money now to research this, so they're going to keep their mouths zipped for the time being. And scientists want to pretend to be objective; they all have strong opinions on it, but they're not speaking out. And we need more scientists to say, whoa, 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 wait a second. That is just outright inaccurate. That is an exaggeration. So I found a website on a university page saying, what is regenerative farming? This is how far this is going. They said, okay, regenerative farming is conservation practices, cover crops, organic methods, plus exaggeration. And so the exaggeration they had as a big plus in the equation of what is regenerative. And I would say the same for carbon sequestration. It's the exaggerations that's making it more saleable. It's like flavor enhancement for food. I mean, what is it going to take to get people to notice it? Well, you exaggerate it. You make it newsworthy. And the real story is, is a more difficult story. And, 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 um, I mean, the long-term studies I'm reading show very, very little gains in carbon in no-till systems. So it's not a done deal. And I think the answer is crop rotations. We have to relearn them. And we have to look at the history, particularly in America, of destroying crop rotations. We have decimated them. They're, they almost don't exist anymore. Why? The economic crop is a row crop right? Animals in the Midwest. I mean, CAFOs exist because we took the animals off the farm. The animals on the farm justified the rotation, right? So we've pulled the whole system apart using economic and scientific analysis. And the whole thing is falling apart now because nature doesn't work according to those modes. And if we can now start rebuilding crop rotation, and maybe, yes, holding organic to a higher standard, I think. We, we didn't look at this close enough when we wrote the, the new Organic Farming Act. It, it, it needs to be emphasized that a rotation has to be correctly designed for this, the climate that you are in, the soil types that you have, their annual rainfall, and so on. And where are the scientists doing crop rotation research? And by the way, once you have a crop rotation, you have to come up with new markets for some of the things you're growing, right? Right. Very complicated. Yeah. Right. And that the, the farming practices are driven by the economics, not by not by biological sanity. Right. And we have to somehow merge it. We all know that we have to find the compromise there. Yeah. And we just haven't found that we've all we've gone in one direction, lock, stock, and barrel. And we've got to start coming back. And my thesis is regenerative. It's actually, it's motivating a lot of people to look at it. And it's, you know, probably 80% inaccurate information at the same time. So the 20% that gets away is truthful. Maybe that's good for us all. 
I started today showing you my soil testing business. We take soils from everybody, anybody that wants to send a sample, and farmers who have just heard the word regenerative, who they would never consider being organic for some reason. They say, we need to do, tell me what's wrong with my soil. I'm really concerned about my soil. So I can just introduce a few ideas and they will start working on that. So in all fairness, everybody has the right to take the word regenerative and look at their farm and say, what can I do that's better? And we, we, should, that's, we should celebrate that. We should celebrate that. But this battle of using it against organic, this is very, very strange. It's very concerning. It's like they're cutting off their, their nose to spite their face. It, it makes no sense that this is happening. And I'm, I'm not going to put my criticism on the agrochemicals. I'm going to talk about the people that are like you and me that are doing that. I'm confronting them and say, why would you do that? And, you know, I've had that argument with some of these leading figures about it. And, you know, usually towards the end of the debate, they soften their tone, realizing there's so much aggregated knowledge of farming systems thanks to the organic discussion that started 100 years ago in Europe. Thanks to that, these questions have come up early, early in time to help with climate change. And that's why organic is the essence of climate change farming, because we started early enough to get the information. We know, we do know what doesn't work. We know if we do too much tillage, we're going to lose structure in our soil. Obviously, tillage can favor erosion because you don't have cover. Now, we know all this from years and decades of experience. And a regenerative community doesn't have this body of comparison and already the studies, science studies are out of the gate in France and Germany critiquing and saying it's not working. And, and they're concerned about the false claims. So I would say regenerative might be in a really difficult straits right now. And finally, you mentioned agrochemicals coming on board. What's it going to look like in the board meeting when you have all the originators of regenerative that are some of the people like you and I? sitting down and then looking across the table who just sat down on the other side. How are they going to work that out, Dave? I wouldn't even want to be in that meeting. Somebody's going to have to raise their hand and say, I want the standards all my way and not your way. And no, I won't accept a compromise. I mean, who's going to do that? It, it, and when will the Federal Trade Commission step in and say, you're all greenwashing and we're getting sick of it? You know, you, no, you may not have a label on food saying regenerative because you can't base it on any validation. They're going to say, oh, maybe we need something like that Organic Farming Act and certification for this label. And at that point, I think the organic community will say, we're ready. We know how to do this. Wouldn't that be interesting? Yes. I think that could happen. I think we could drive that to happen. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you'll subscribe, share the link with your friends, and leave us a rating and a review so that others can find us. A video version of this interview is found at realorganicproject.org and by following our YouTube channel. Please join us next time when we'll share the second half of this interview with today's guest, soil scientist, Will Brinton. And please remember that it's not too late to buy a ticket to our 2023 virtual symposium and receive a replay link. You can learn more at realorganicsymposium.org.